Uh, Professor Ed Kleinbard, thank you for joining us on Tax Notes Live. I know you were in Washington, D.C. recently where you testified before the House Ways and Means Committee on Corporate Tax Reform, in particular the U.S. international regime. Now, during those hearings, you spoke of a, quote, a false narrative regarding claims of anti-competitiveness. Can you tell our audience what exactly is the false narrative? The false narrative uh, which is always, of course, expressed through sports metaphors, is that um, the United States uh, is no longer fielding competitive teams on the uh, playing fields of business competition. Uh, and, the, and the reason is uh, outbound uh, international tax system. The narrative suggests that U.S. firms invert because they have no choice, because the U.S. system is uncompetitive and they're therefore not able to compete effectively uh, with uh, foreign firms outside the United States. And the narrative says that the United States is alone among major economies in taxing the foreign earnings of U.S. firms over and above what they pay to the uh, uh, local tax authorities. And of course, the U.S. tax rate uh, is the highest uh, tax rate in the developed world. Um, so uh, firms have no choice but to invert simply to remain competitiveness. And in response, the only appropriate policy response uh, is to leapfrog over all other countries um, in lowering our tax rates on f foreign uh, direct investment. Uh, and in doing so, slide all the way down to the hill, uh, the hill to the lightest possible uh, tax burden mm -hmm. on U.S. multinationals in the form of a toothless territorial tax system. Oh, well, some commentators will say that it's imperative that the U.S. switches to a territorial system, which, of course, means you'd exempt foreign earnings. Uh, but, uh, you know, has it ever really been sufficiently established that our current system of, of dealing with double taxation, in other words, a foreign tax credit regime, does that fail to mitigate uh, double taxation? Is, is there something that I'm missing there? Well, in fact, our current system, whatever the label, our current system operates as an airsats kind of territorial system uh, without any of the safeguards that a, that a well-designed territorial system, um, in fact, uh, would implement. Uh, the first point, of course, is that foreign earnings are not taxed in the United States. Foreign earnings uh, uh, can be deferred indefinitely outside the United States. Uh, and what's more can be deferred indefinitely from a financial accounting perspective, which is vitally important, because that's the real lens through which uh, the investment community looks at firms. So both as a cash tax matter uh, and as a financial accounting matter, uh, firms can postpone any reckoning with the U.S. tax system indefinitely. Then uh, it is said, well, but these earnings are locked out and they're... Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we hear that all the time. We, we hear exactly. that all the time. And, and uh, the, the, the truth there, again, is much more nuanced. First, those earnings aren't locked out in the sense that they're outside the U.S. economy because they're in U.S. dollar assets to the extent they're in cash. There are some, there are some misallocations going on. Firms have, in effect, a, a, an incentive to buy foreign targets with their offshore uh, cash hoard. But um, in respect of the cash that they, that they hold, or cash equivalents, that's invested in U.S. dollar assets. That's in the U.S. economy. And what's more, as Apple just demonstrated, when Apple borrowed $12 billion last week, firms can, in fact, get their hands on their offshore earnings uh, in a tax-free repatriation through borrowing in the United States, because then they hold an investment asset offshore, and a, and a liability onshore, the two net to zero by borrowing onshore uh, and distributing those proceeds to shareholders, U.S. companies effectively can, can uh, get the equivalent of a tax-free repatriation of cash. So the, the, the headline rate, which unquestionably is too high, mm -hmm. the headline rate has, is almost completely irrelevant to um, the tax posture of uh, sophisticated U.S. multinationals. The, the entire focus uh, of international tax debates in Washington is perverse and backwards. Uh, well, Professor, uh, you coined a 
a term a few years ago, um, and we're talking here about stateless income. That label has profoundly influenced the national dialogue over tax policy. Um, people won't stop talking about it, not over, only domestically, but abroad as well. If you attend a meeting of the OECD, it, it's clear that, uh, that your concept of stateless income contributed to their thinking on the whole BEPS project. Now, for the benefit of any listeners who aren't familiar with your previous writings, could you briefly explain what is stateless income and how our current system facilitates that outcome? Sure. When I originally uh, coined the term, I had in mind a slightly narrower uh, use than, than the term might be applied for today. I think today it sometimes get, gets applied for the proposition that U.S. firms don't pay tax anywhere in the world on uh, their income not booked in the United States. <laughs> and, um, and the same, of course, is true for other multinationals vis-a-vis uh, -vis their uh, home countries. Mm -hmm. When I originally um, used the term, I meant in a slightly narrower sense in, in, in that I, what I was trying to do was to get uh, folk to realize that international tax planning um, – and low effective tax rates was not simply the story of moving income out from the United States. All, this is all viewed, of course, from the perspective of a U.S. multinational. Mm -hmm. Not simply moving income out of the United States, but rather moving income away from high-tax foreign countries to low-tax foreign countries, mm -hmm. with the result that foreign effective tax rates for major U.S. multinationals is frequently are in the uh, mid-single digits. And, of course, there's no country in the world where they're actually doing business that has tax rates uh, so low. Mm -hmm. uh, but by using uh, uh, earning stripping type devices to move income from high-tax foreign jurisdictions to low-tax foreign jurisdictions, U.S. multinationals have an incentive to invest abroad because it's easier to move income Sure from high-tax foreign jurisdictions than it is to move income from the U.S. Uh, they have um, a, uh, an incentive, of course, uh, to strip, and um, they uh, earn, in a sense, uh, what I call tax rents. They earn um, what are high pre-tax rates of return that reflect the, the, the uh, substantial tax rates in the major economies where they actually do business. Mm -hmm but then pay tax on that nowhere in the world. Um, and so uh, the result is the problems one sees with U.S. multinationals uh, doing business all over the world, being very successful in terms of their actual business operations all over the world, and yet recording uh, tax rates in, uh, that are derisorily low in respect of their international operations. Mm -hmm. Now, on top of that, and using the same technologies, we also have the problem of uh, income shifting away from the United States. But I wanted to broaden the debate uh, so that people could understand that that tax planning for a U.S. multinational was not simply about income shifting from the United States. It was income shifting from all high-tax countries, right. wherever they do business, to low-tax and essentially uh, close to zero-tax jurisdictions. Uh, any chance that the OECD BEPS project might help fix that, you think? Well, the, the OECD BEPS project needs to be given a chance. I, I feel quite strongly that it therefore um, uh, bad form uh, to speak too badly, or too negatively about it. But it's it's a very difficult uh, undertaking mm -hmm. because it, the BEPS project has started from a couple of bedrock assumptions that are um, uh, really unhelpful. Uh, from a tax point of view. The first, of course, of, is to continue to respect the separate corporate, uh, the separate juridical yes. personality of corporate subsidiaries as if they were independent actors rather than to treat the U.S., uh, to treat a multinational as one enterprise, mm -hmm. which after all is the entire reason to have the, the multinational in the first place. That's, yeah. that's the value it adds is, is the synergies of its worldwide operations. And yet that's the very thing we deny at the bedrock uh, of, of our uh, tax analysis. So uh, they start with that problem, which then in turn requires some application of arm's length pricing to figure out the separate 
income of each of those juridical persons. That in turn leads to all the difficulties with intellectual property, all the earning stripping problems through group capitalization, all the issues with which we're familiar. And you know, BEPS has struggled to um, uh, mitigate some of the problems. But in the end, uh, whether BEPS succeeds is very much an open question. Well, let's talk about something that uh, did not succeed, and that was the tax reform proposal by former Ways and Means Chairman Dave Camp. And you've previously spoken of some uh, having some admiration for the work underlying that plan. Uh, what about the Camp approach most impressed you? Well, uh, I thought that the Camp uh, tax reform proposal um, represented a lot of good work, and I didn't agree with every single uh, decision, but fundamentally, first, uh, it was revenue neutral or, or uh, uh, attempted to be revenue mm -hmm. neutral. It was not uh, a pie in the sky projection that the magic growth fairy would descend on us uh, and make up uh, any any shortfalls. Quite unrealistic assumptions that are made uh, by others. Sure. Second, in order to get there, he made some very hard decisions, uh, for example, uh, limiting uh, advertising expenses. Yeah. Those were um, courageous uh, positions to stake out. And third, and in particular, uh, of particular importance in the international uh, arena, he recognized that a territorial tax system by itself um, is doomed to collapse because it simply um, uh, uh, is a, uh, a license to engage in even more aggressive stateless income planning with complete impunity. That because all territorial systems at their core rely on the premise that one can identify the geographic source where right. income arises, and given the, the importance of uh, intellectual property, in uh, the, as the driver of profits of multinational firms in general, um, uh, focusing in particular on the, that, the, the problems of intellectual property, it just it's clear that it is extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, to determine the geographic source uh, where income actually arises from complex uh, multinational uh, firms doing business in different parts of the of the world, all coming together uh, to earn income in one particular country. Professor Edward Kleinbart, thank you for joining us on Tax Notes Live.